I started out as, as a fan, like, like most people in the industry. I started out, you know, watching movies growing up, you know, watching them on TV, going to matinees. And a particular movie caught my eye. It was The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Uh, I didn't really understand how the monsters were done, but later I discovered that it was stop motion, and I said, I, I really want to learn how to do this kind of stuff. So I got as much information as I could. I read uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland, which is a magazine that a lot of people bought back in those days. And uh, it was very interesting to see you know, how stop motion was done. I learned about Ray Harryhausen and uh, tried to mimic some of his work in some of my early amateur films. When I graduated from high school, I, I just took a, a, a normal job until I decided what I wanted to do. And I was working as a uh, box boy at one of the local markets in, in town. And I knew I wanted to get into the, the movie industry somehow, so I tried to get into the prop builders union just to, you know, to get a, a real job working in the industry and learn. But that didn't work out. And eventually I got a lead to uh, Jim Danforth's phone number. I followed that through, talked to Jim, and he recommended Cloakey Productions. And I called Cloakey Productions, got a, a meeting with Art Cloakey, showed him some of my amateur films. I was working there on The Adventures of Gumby, and a young fellow named Rick Baker came to work there after school. He'd work there after uh, you know, about three o'clock or so. He'd come in and work a few hours part-time and did some sculpting and mold making and some painting on some of the episodes we were working on. And we found that we had a lot in common, along with uh, Harry Walton, also started working there. And we'd, we pretty much grew up with the same interest, you know, read the same magazines, saw the same movies, you know, so we all kind of became like, a, you know, fans of, of the same work. We all had the same interest. Octoman while I was still working at Cloakey Productions because um, if I remember the series of events, Harry Walton and I got a, a small shop out in Azusa that we were using on weekends and evenings to build armatures and, and, and work on our stop motion stuff. I had a short stop motion film I was doing with cavemen in it and Rick Baker got the gig to do the Octoman and asked if I would be interested in helping him out with it. And we used that shop is where we built it, built the suit. George Barr did a, did a, a color illustration of the Octoman that Rick Baker then in turn did a, a three-dimensional sculpture. He did a, it was about a one foot, maybe 14 inch maquette of the, of the creature in clay. And then he painted it up with like, a, what the final paint job might look like. It came kind of natural to me because I, I kind of like the, the hands-on mechanical building side of things anyway. I re, I'm not really an, an artist as, as far as a designer. You know, I can do some rough sketches enough to get by, but I wouldn't do a sketch that I'd want to present in, in a meeting, you know, <laughs> try to sell something. I'd hire that part of it done. But uh, it came kind of natural, although we were kind of in, inventing stuff because we hadn't really, really built a suit like that before and we had a really limited budget. We, we knew we couldn't use molds, you know, we couldn't build a big mold, so we chose to fabricate the suit. So the process of molding versus fabricating, uh, molding you would sculpt a piece, take a mold of that, and then cast up a, a, a finished piece, or fabricating you would start with the, maybe an inner suit that the actor would wear, and you would start gluing foam pieces that are, are either scissored or cut somehow and, and you build up a shape of that and then you'd add late foam latex or liquid latex on top of that and you would just add on to build up to a finished look that you'd want. Now, in the case of the Octoman we used, uh, we used a, a denim material to build the, the inner suit. We glued uh, like mattress foam, you know, poly foam onto that and then on top of that we mixed up raw liquid latex foam, actually like the type you would inject in a makeup appliance mold, but instead of injecting it in a mold, we, we actually brushed it on with spatulas. We would put it on the, on the polyfoam, you know, and that would seal the pores of the polyfoam. And then we used syringes and we'd, we'd squeeze out veins and, and, and we'd just kind of put blotches and, and 
you know, try to make like uh, bumps and warts and whatever, whatever you're going to do. But it was all done in, in raw liquid foam. Once that, you know, set, it, it kind of gels and becomes set, then it had to be baked. And of course, we're dealing with a huge suit and we didn't have an oven. So we built this huge box, this huge plywood box, lined it with uh, uh, aluminum foil. And it was probably four by four by six feet tall, big enough we could get this, this big suit in there. And then we put space heaters all around this suit and plugged it in and had a little porthole that we could look in there and then we pull out a thermometer and see it's not up to temperature yet. It took several hours to heat this huge box with nothing but uh, four heaters. Yes, we can us! <laughs> The uh, actor who played uh, the Aquaman was Reed Morgan. I think he was actor stuntman, because it was kind of a rough, rough assignment. Anytime you have to wear a suit, it, it's rough. Rick, wo bleiben Sie denn? Ich komme Ihnen zur Hilfe! Your visibility is limited, especially when something like this, because it doesn't have your same eye lines. Plus, you know, breathing is, you know, you don't have good airflow because you're behind something and it's hot, it's damp. It's cold, you know, it's, it's, it's just the opposite. You know, if it's at night, you're freezing. If it's in the day, you're, you, you're overheating, you know, so it's not a, a fun assignment, but uh, we tried to make them as comfortable as, as possible, you know, whenever we could. The roughest time was when he had to get wet. There were some scenes that we shot where he had to, you know, physically tromp through the water and, and raise out of the water. And we're talking big, heavy foam suit that just soaks up soaks up the water. <laughs> we shot at night. We shot night for night for some stuff, and we shot day for night on other stuff. We only had the one suit, because you know, had there been a mold, you could easily have mass produced suits, but no, we had the one suit, so we had to make sure it got dried out between days, and uh, you know, if it, got, if it went in the water. Can't remember what order we shot in, but uh, you know, it would have made sense if we did the water stuff last, but I don't remember if we did that. <laughs> It just gets heavy. It's like a big sponge. So you have to bring all the water out. And uh, I don't think he ever went above his, his waist. I think it, he only went waist deep in the water. But even that, that's, that's a lot of water. Die Blutproben, die wir hier von den Eingeborenen gemacht haben, weisen deutlich darauf hin, dass die Gewässer in dieser Gegend nachweisbar radioaktiv verseucht sind und somit auch der ganze Fischbestand. Kerwin Matthews was a... <laughs> What sort of a hero to me? Uh, he worked on the seventh voyage of Sinbad and Jack the Giant Killer, which were two of my favorite stop motion films. And he played the hero in, in both of those films. And when I found out he was, he was on this picture, you know, it was like, that, that made my day. Hello, Pedro, Carlos. I think it would have made it better as if him and Ray Harryhausen had been on this picture. You know, between, uh, takes. We'd sit there in, in the shade of Bronson Canyon, which is up there in the Hollywood Hills, and, uh, and talk about his experience working with Ray Harryhausen, which he had you know, nothing but great things to say. Action, Steve. Bring it back. Harry Essex. He was fun. I didn't know of Harry Essex. Of course, I knew of the pictures he had written. I knew of uh, you know, Creature from the Black Lagoon, and it came from outer space. In fact, The Creature from the Black Lagoon was the first movie that I ever sat in the theater by myself at a matinee to see. I mean, our parents dropped us off to see The Creature from the Black Lagoon, uh, I think The Mole People, and Tarantula on a triple bill. So I, you know, that, that was my introduction, was the film he wrote. So I was familiar with his work, but didn't really connect the name until this picture. Well, there were, there were some moments. In fact, there, when you're working on the set on a low-budget picture, it seems to be some great, great stories. Uh, one of them that, personally, I had to work one evening. Rick and I switched off to, to save on, on, uh, for budget restraints. You know, we, had, we couldn't both be on the set the same day, so, so we, he'd work one day and I'd work the next. And I had a night shift on one of the days. We were shooting up at, I think it was uh, Franklin Canyon Reservoir up in the Hollywood Hills, and they needed this, the tentacle to come out of the water and rock the boat, and that was me. 
had to get in the water. It's like in the middle of the night. The water was well, probably up to my waist. And then I'd get under the water and grab the edge of the boat. And when they see the tentacle, they would help me rock it because obviously I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't rock it myself. And I did that take, got back out of the water, it was freezing cold, shivering, went to the RV to get dressed. I'm in the shower, I'm taking it, and I, I hear this knock on the door. They want to do the take again. Ah! So I'm getting, I'm getting ready, coming back out, and they say, oh, never mind. We changed them. <laughs> the first day started out on a weird note. Rick and I show up up at Bronson Canyon. This is the first day. It was our first day call. Be there, whatever it was, 7 o'clock or whatever. And Rick and I show up, and we're there. And nobody else is showing up. Hour goes by, you know, it's just, just Rick and I and the coyotes up at Branson Canyon. So we just said, maybe we better call these guys. We called them up and they go, oh, we pushed today. We're, we're not going <laughs> to, it's not till tomorrow. They forgot to call us, you know, the monster guys. <laughs> I saw the film when it first was released. I, I think it came out uh, about a year later after we did it. Didn't get a wide run, but it did, it did show in theaters. And I took my mom to see it, because, you know, I, my first movie, you know, I had to go see it. And it was fun, it was fun to see, you know, up on the big screen, you know, first movie. What did mom think? She was very polite, said she loved it. <laughs> I think any, any assignment, whether, no matter you know, how it turns out, uh, it's still a good as, uh, assignment. The, you know, Octoman was, was, you know, I was really excited about it. I was excited to see it. I was excited to have worked on it. And it's, I think it helps you because you learn, you learn how movies are made, you know, and you learn how to work on a tight budget. Sometimes you work on uh, really low budget films and sometimes you work on uh, high budget films and it's a whole different, different animal. I actually enjoyed the low budget ones because you have to be a little more creative sometimes to figure out how to how get, get stuff done. You meet people on the set, you know, you make connections, you, you, uh, you learn how to do stuff maybe you hadn't learned before, like building this suit. I never, never built a, a full suit before. I'd, I'd, done, I'd worked in foam before, I'd sculpted little things and this and that, but I, I never really, you know, did anything that on that scale before. So it was a great experience.